This is a notice for all participants. This is a public meeting and proceedings are being webcast live online. A recording will also be available for playback on the Council's website shortly afterwards. Please note that your name will appear in the live stream and in the recording. Should you not wish for your image to appear on these, please turn off your camera. Third parties should not record or film the local plan hearing sessions and neither the council nor the planning inspector are liable for any third party recordings. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone, it's 10 o'clock, so it's time for me to resume the hearing sessions as part of the examination of the Sunbridge Wales Borough Local Plan. Um, welcome along this morning, um, for those of you who maybe haven't attended previous sessions, although I think probably everybody has. Um, my name is Matthew Birkinshaw, Chartered Town Planner and the Inspector appointed by the Secretary of State to hold the examination. Just very quickly, um, a couple of housekeeping matters. The programme officer, Charlotte Glancy, um, can't be with us this week. Um, and so um, Hannah has, has, has stepped in. Um, the same as previous days, really. Um, so obviously, Charlotte remains the programme officer. It's the same contact details. So if anybody does have any questions or queries about documents, um, obviously, today's session um, or any of the examination library, please do speak to um, Hannah um, here either today virtually or um, just via the, the usual email address um, to Charlotte who, like I said, re remains the programme officer. So today's session is um, one of the reserve sessions that we have um, as part of the examination. And I think all the participants who were um, who are down to attend today have attended previous sessions. So I won't go through um, all, all the, the usual housekeeping matters about the use of technology and, and the sort of the role and function and purpose of the hearing. So obviously um, you, you have all attended previous sessions. Um, so when we met last time, we were discussing the um, obviously the, the site allocations and looking at sites in Cranbrook in particular. Um, obviously the Turden Farm site was one of the ones in particular that we that we discussed. And when we met last time, there was um, there was there was a uncertainty potentially regarding um, an, an impending such a state decision. Um, is it worthwhile just sort of appreciate that, that maybe members of the public observing this session online. So is it just maybe worthwhile, just maybe if I could ask someone from the council, just to maybe update the hearing as to where we've got to with that decision and any, any correspondence then, which has occurred um, since the last time we met to talk about this site. Yes, so I'm going to ask David Scully, um, just, just to update you. Thanks, sir. Uh, we were informed uh, previously that a decision would be made by uh, 4th of July, I believe it was. Um, since then, we've received notice that the decision has been delayed and we have no further uh, indication of when that uh, decision will be made. OK, so there's no, there was no re revised date or in indicative get date given then? No. OK. Um, so as far as the council's concerned then, um, and, and we'll, we'll get into some of the detail of the allocation, but if in, in, as far as the council's concerned, um, 
Where do you consider that leaves the examination and the assessment of this site then? Um, so, so far as we are concerned, um, we believe the site falls to be assessed as part of this examination. Um, we, we are uh, promoting the site as an allocation and believe the evidence base supports it. Um, and we, we can address that this morning um, in substantial terms uh, and uh, are also happy, in fact, would invite you to hear us in relation to the substance of the objections to the allocation, um, particularly with regard to the expert work that has uh, gone into the allocation in terms of supporting it. And I refer particularly uh, to the Hankerson Duckett report, which you have and no doubt seen. Um, clearly, um, the outcome of the Secretary of State's decision-making process is a matter which does concern you um, because it relates to substantially the same site and a proposal that is consistent with the allocation and its parameters. Um, that being so, um, um, you will want to know um, the outcome of the Secretary of State de determination and the reasons for it. And it's the examination of the reasons for the decision, uh, which will bear upon your own uh, determination in the context of this examination. Um, there are various permutations uh, which could arise depending upon the outcome of the decision and the timing of that decision. Um, and those permutations which are consequential on timing are matters which I don't think we need to address at this moment in time. I think uh, we will know better where we stand in that regard uh, once we know what your decision is with respect to the evidence you've heard in relation to the plan as a whole, uh, whether there's a decision to proceed to the modification stage and how long that modifications process will take. And clearly, um, the modifications process uh, could include uh, as one possibility uh, the deletion of the site could um, um, that's not a route we would ask you to go down of course um, but that that's one possible outcome um, in in terms of um, um, the impact it has on uh, the allocation and the scope of the allocation and the wording of the policy there may be implications from the Secretary of State's decision which you would want to take into account. Uh, and again, that, that's a question of timing as well, in the sense that uh, one would hope uh, that if the decision does have any bearing on the scope of the allocation um, uh, or the wording or requirements of the policy itself, you will have time in which to take those into account through the modifications process. So that's how I see it uh, working. I think for the purposes of today's uh, session, it's important that you hear us in relation to the substance, uh, particularly in the context of the AOMB and the impact which any development of the site as proposed through the allocation will have. Um, and to deal with this, as it were, at plan level, not as, it, as if it were a section 78 hearing. It's not that kind of session and your um, determination should be at plan level. Whatever others might urge, it should be at plan level. So, so that, that's what I say about it. Mr. Marici may, may, may have his own views about it too. So again, just by, just by way of introduction then as to context and where we've got to, so a similar question, Mr. Marici, did you have anything? you wish to add? Uh, so yes, can I just briefly, sir, I mean, I, I would endorse everything that's been said by the council. So on timing, obviously, having had the delay, we've had a change in Secretary of State, and we may have another change in Secretary of State. Um, that may mean the decision in terms of when we get it is going could be several months away now. Uh, I think we have to accept that that's possible. But so we would strongly endorse that 
um, you can and should consider the allocation on the basis of the evidence that has been submitted by the council and other parties, including ourselves. And obviously some of that includes material from evidence from the inquiry, which you are of course entitled to consider insofar as it's been put before you. And so can I just make one other point in terms of how we go forward on this? Um, the call-in of the application was uh, as a result of Natural England uh, writing to the Secretary of State to object to the planning application. And one of their key points that they made at the inquiry, and so I can give you references to the closing speech that we put in about where the sources of that are, but the key issue they had at the inquiry, the absolute key issue they maintained, was that they felt that if this site was to be developed, that that should be decided through the plan process rather than through an ad hoc planning application. And so obviously you know that they have maintained an objection up to the plan, uh, Regulation 19 stage, although they haven't taken part in the examination um, since then. But an absolute key point for them was they felt the better route was to go through the plan process. And obviously, sir, that may be where we're heading in any event, given the delay in the, in the decision. So, so those are the only points that I would make um, at, at, at that stage. But more generally, we support everything that's been said um, on behalf of the council. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Watson, again, just any sort of opening comments then, just on sort of context and, and where we are in, in terms of, of the process and in alignment with the Secretary of State decision? Um, thank you, sir. Yes, of course, the, the factual situation is exactly as, been, uh, as has been described to you. Um, it is, though, inevitable that this um, allocation if it were to be included in the policy, would take effect subject to uh, the Secretary of State's decision. Um, to include the policy in its present form now is essentially to prejudge that decision. Should the Secretary of State accept the arguments put forward very strongly by both Natural England and the high wheeled AOMB, um, the latter uh, sadly un unable to attend today due to Dr. Marsh's illness, that this is not a suitable site for a major development in the AONB and that the necessary tests in the MPPF are not satisfied, then uh, the allocation would be entirely inconsistent with that decision. Should the Secretary of State um, come down in favor of the council and the developer, uh, then that is effectively an implementation of, of this allocation. And uh, the um, uh, it, it really matters <laughs> not whether the allocation is included in the plan or not. Um, there are various intermediate permutations that might suggest some development other than what is proposed in the application and in this allocation is appropriate. However, in that context, it seems to me that this in, entire session, insofar as it is concerned with the assessment of the merits of the allocation, is, is rather a waste of time. The matter is to all intents and purposes, in the hands of the Secretary of State. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Wooden, I think we may have lost the inspector in the course of that. I can't now see him on the screen. Yeah, we did. Hannah, can you advise us on the inspector's situation, please? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to email him now. He's just. I think he was there when I began. Yeah, he was there when you began. Yes, I think you lost him halfway through. Let's find out.
I'm just waiting for him to rejoin. Sorry, apologies, everyone. I think that was my uh, my broadband that cut out. Four weeks of virtual hearings, not one problem. Then we get to the last day and uh, uh, the broadband packs up. Sorry, Mr. Woodson, you were uh, I, I I lost you. You ju you just started and you said there was concerns about sort of um, you know prejudging that that decision potentially. Yes, uh, the the point I was making, sir, in in, in the absence of um, the representative of the high wheeled AONB due to illness, is that um, the, the matter is to all intents and purposes in the hands of the Secretary of State. The application is, as I think uh, Mr. Shadow Rivian um, acknowledged, um, consistent with the terms of this proposed allocation, should the um, Secretary of State approve the uh, application, uh, then that that effectively determines the matter, and it, it, the, the local plan is practically irrelevant. Um, should the um, our Secretary of State accept the arguments put forward by Natural England, the High Wheeled AONB, and ourselves, CPRE Kent, that the site is not an, a suitable site for a major development in the AONB, um, then the proposed allocation would be consistent with that decision, which would be based upon a, a report by an inspector far more detailed in relation to this site than it is feasible for you in the course of this planning inquiry to achieve. Um, uh, various intermediate um, outcomes are possible, but in that situation, um, the, the terms of the inspector's, uh, the Secretary of State's decision would be highly material. Um, it se seems to me that, that for us to spend the day rehearsing the arguments that were put forward in the course of a very lengthy hearing is rather a waste of everybody's time. And that the matter of the inclusion or not of this site in the local plan must and can await the outcome of the Secretary of State's determination of the planning application. Thank you. And I think that's the difficulty of this because it, it's, um, you know, clear, clearly, this is a site. The council has put this site forward um, for inclusion within within the local plan, and and the council has submitted what it considers to be a sound plan, and, and it's for me to examine the soundness and the justification for that. I think this goes back to the points we discussed the, the, the first time round on this session is that we simply don't know the outcome of that decision, and 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 I don't think it's appropriate to sort of try and speculate what the inspector and secretary of state may or may not say. Um, in in their reports, we 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 simply don't know, um, and, and we discussed last time, didn't we? It's you know, it was it was a consideration of well, um, you know, planning permission may be refused, but it, it but that might not might be refused on a very individual or very um, particular part of the scheme, part of the design, and I think at this stage we are just considering um, we are considering the the justification for the for the allocation of the land rather than and, and and this is the difficulty and 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 we've had it a lot with you know the, the cinema site was another another example you know the other day where um you know gets getting drawn into discussions between um very individual particular um planning applications and actually the development plan and what the plant you know what the local plan is seeking to do um, if the council's got any additional comments on that. Uh, no, simply to say, sir, that it's incumbent on you, I would respectfully suggest, to deal with this today and mm -hmm. not on a contingent basis, i.e. As, as a proposal in the plan. Yeah. Okay, so 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 looking at the allocation then, we we've we've spent a lot of time um during this, during the course of this this local plan examination discussing these issues. And, and as I said at the start, you know, we, we, we started with sort of the, the, the big strategic issues around strategy. 
So we've already discussed the matters around, um, well, why did the council even look here in the first place? So we've already discussed those issues with, you know, we've, you know, I've asked questions of the council and, 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 and they've responded with, with, you know, with their evidence and their justification to say, well, why are you even building houses in the AOMB? Why can't your strategy avoid the AOMB? And that goes back to sort of weeks, um, you know, one, one and two when we met in the council offices. The second part of that then moved on and it was about understanding the, um, the methodology the council used. So you've got that high level decisions about where growth is going to go and then the methodology that the council used to actually determine um, determine the sites. And again, um, it was it was a Friday that day as well, um, where we were all in the council uh, in the council office, and we, and we talked at length about the site selection methodology and and various people around the table, um, you know, put put their representations forward, which they which they're entitled to do, and sort of criticised that, and and we we had a sort of um, for and against debate about that. So we've had the discussion around the strategy. We've had the discussion about the ways in which then the council sought to um, sought to allocate sites and, and the process with which they 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 took and they used. So I think really all that's left to discuss for, for today's um, session then, um, I, I think as as the council's advocate pointed out at the start, is, is really to pick up on some of the actual specific objections um, and representations uh, a, a, against this site. Then, um, Mr. Mitch, you've got, you've got your hand up. Any, do you, do you agree with that? Instead of essentially saying we, we don't need to get back into the strategy or the process of site selection methodology and the history of why the council came to sort of choose growth in this location. Uh, I think oh. Mr. Marich has lost his broadband. I wonder whether the program officer will be kind enough to contact him. Hannah, are you there? It may be. Oh, we've gone off screen now. Must be Friday. Everyone's internet's given up. One of, one of those days. Given up. It's decided to go. go it's decided to go to the beach. Let's say we've got all the way through four weeks, let's see, four, four weeks of virtual hearings. We've got right to the very last yeah. session. Um, and we've not got a problem. I, can, I think we can hear them. Okay, we'll just give them a minute. Probably having to do what I did and reboot it all. Hello, sir, can you hear us? We can, yeah. Oh, okay, but we can't hear them. We can't hear you at the moment, sir. Just trying to resolve it. I apologise. James, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Um, let's see if it's working now. So, sir, can I? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. I apologise, sir. We lost sound, but I think we're now resolved. So thank you, sir. So I apologise. So can you hear me? Yep, yeah, everything okay? Yes, thank you, sir. Okay, so um, as, as I was saying, obviously, I, I, I think I, I was saying there, we don't need to get back into the, the, the strategy, the reasons um, why there's growth here and, and the site selection methodology. And at that point, you put your hand up, Mr. Marici, so I wasn't sure whether you wanted to come in. No, sir, I apologise. I was, I was only because we'd lost sound, so it wasn't for any other reason. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so looking at the um, looking at the potential impacts then, um, what I think it'd be worthwhile doing is obviously at the start of the session the council said they wanted to sort of go through um, some of the um, some of the ob ob objections and, and issues that have been raised 
Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy to sort of hand over to the council if you want to pick pick up on any particular points. If not, I can sort of lead you through them, really. Um, Mr Scully? Uh, thank you, sir. I think it's easy to go through them. Uh, you have, uh, uh, and it's really, we're focused here on uh, the a and B unit who have made Pacific reference. Uh, Natural England were concerned in principle and uh, as has already been intimated, they saw this as something to be decided at a uh, local plan examination. Um, the, there was a, received an email this morning, I think from the NAB unit, apologizing that they were or felt unable to attend today. There was just one point in that email, which I think is important to note. Um, the uh, co-director of the High World says, uh, this is the only, the second public inquiry in 10 years that the ANAB uh, director has attended as an expert witness. Um, I'm aware of uh, three occasions uh, uh, of which uh, Ms. Marsh has attended a examination in Tunbridge World Borough. The first was the local plan examination for the um, allocation of Brick Kiln Farm. Uh, to which there was an objection, but the inspector uh, allowed that scheme. The second was uh, Hartley Gate, uh, which is a smaller site. And originally was in Regulation 18. Um, there was an appeal on that site. It's not in the plan now. And that's immediately to the west of um, uh, the site we're discussing today. And finally, it was at the Turnden uh, examination. Um, there may be other sites across the ANB that she attended, but I'm not aware of those. Um, you have two representations that relate to uh, this site. One was in relation to um, matter two, issue one. As you said, there's no need to uh, go over all of that, but there was one particular point in there, which I think is relevant uh, to this site. Uh, and it was their statement at 3.6 referring to objective S2 of the ANB management plan, which seeks to prioritize the delivery of new housing, primarily through small scale development and a mix of housing sizes that responds to local needs. Um, what is important here is that delivery is primarily through small scale housing. That it clearly indicates to us that there will be occasions when new development will be provided on larger scale developments. Um, our provision in this plan is mostly smaller scale and of the 24 allocations for housing in the ANOB, we cover this in appendix uh, three, matter three, uh, only six are considered to be major and a further four on a cumulative basis. It's worth noting that 18 sites proposed in the ANOB at Reg 18 were removed at Reg 19. The council has to consider other matters in addition to the ANOB even though it has great weight, including sustainability. And this is a highly sustainable location. So it's not surprising one of the larger developments is at this, at this site. Um, and it's also pertinent to note that smaller scale sites may not deliver the necessary uh, improvements and so on. And the last sentence shows that this is an in-principle objection from their representation that major development cannot be accommodated within the ANOB. That is not what national policy uh, says, sir. And we've, we, we've, we've been through that. Um, the unions have also submitted a statement uh, for matter seven, uh, turned and farm, uh, stated the 23rd of June. And uh, there were a few points to go through there. It does talk about the landscape evidence base for the allocation. And you'll see paragraph eight there. Uh, it refers to the Hankinson Ducket LVIA. You'll see, sir, that the uh, Natural England have uh, agreed this work. They do say that it's not in itself uh, um, uh, justify allocation and we agree that point but it's part of the evidence that needs to be provided however the unit have criticized that and they say things such as in here the description assessment turned and omits positive features reinforces negative ones especially notice is the focus on derelict and disused pony paddocks no mentions made a perception of rural tranquility uh, etc 
and that goes over the page on their statement and talks about unsubstantiated claims made uh, are made such as proposals are in keeping with Cranbrook's existing settlement pattern. So if we take up the Hankerson Ducket LVA, which is 3.96 E, um, I'm afraid, sir, it is not uh, paginated. But I think um, we've touched on this many times, but it's worth um, uh, looking at the document itself. Do you have it, sir? Yeah, yeah. I've got it, got it in front of me. So um, you'll see the first part of it is looking at the settlement as a whole. And whilst there are three sites to be considered there, CRR6, which is actually the Hartley Gate uh, scheme, uh, which is now no longer in the plan. Uh, CRS4 and CRS7, and CRS7 is no longer in the plan, but it also shows all the other allocations. And then it shows the context. Important in this context is some further analysis. You'll see a sort of purple zigzag line between uh, uh, the Turnden site and uh, Hartley, and that's identified in the key as an essential separation between settlements. So that's been taken into account. Then there's plans showing the settlement uh, evolution. Then there's plans showing the historic landscape character that's taken from the uh, historic landscape character assessment, which was done by the high wall unit. Then we have a, a section on landscape character, which refers to the uh, borough landscape character assessment and the objectives and so on within that document and how they relate to the site. Then we have a section on landscape sensitivity and it picks out elements in relation to the landscape sensitivity. And it's been noted here, if you look at the box uh, top right, uh, CRS4, sensitivity rating high, high, medium, you'll see the last sentence, um, adjacent to the allocated ALCR4 development on the edge of Cranbrook around Turndon and remaining gaps along Hartley Road proximity to existing intended development means that sensitivity is slightly lower. That's a key point of the assessment. Then we have the character plans. Then we have the uh, site location and context. And then on this next page, just to counter the uh, issues that were raised about negativity. If we look at the third column, it has perceptual and experiential qualities. And it talks about uh, second uh, paragraph down, things like wooden streams, ponds and individual trees within the site and to the site boundaries provide interest and character. It then talks about an attractive view over open pasture towards Cranbrook but it does also then say about the detracting elements. We then have in terms of the last column, representatives of Annaby qualities. And you'll see, sir, there's a section there on settlement and it talks about historic farmsteads within the site, Turndon Farm, Henneker Farm, of which only the ponds at Henneker Pit remain and goes on to talk about the routeways um, and the development of the site's potential to influence the character of these routeways. So it's hard to see how this is not um, uh, balanced in that way. The statement then goes on to say, benefits are claimed without a balancing view of what will be lost. And uh, unsurprisingly, given this bias, uh, it, it bases its judgment on, and also talks about um, New woodland wild malflows are said to replace issued pony paddocks. Um, and uh, that um, it talks about um, benefits claimed without a balancing view of what will be lost. For example, a new woodland screen would apparently be beneficial for people used in the right of way. So if you turn the page, you come to the assessment sheet. Um, so there's a there's a plan there showing the uh, Reg 18 and Reg 19, and following that, there's the assessment sheet. And then in the last uh, column, it talks about potential to avoid or reduce effects. So this is exactly what this column is doing. And this is where the reference is made about um, the apparently beneficial use uh, uh, there. But this column is all about 
what potential there is to avoid or reduce adverse effects. And it talks about there some of the mitigation measures that can be can be done there. And this is where those comments are picked up from. So the proposed woodland would further screen views of both the proposed allocation and the permitted development to the north of the site and at Turden Farm, which would be beneficial for people using the right of way because it's screening views of, of the allocated development in the uh, south. Um, the draft allocation open space and proposed landscape bubbles would maintain the sense of separation between Cranbrook and Hartley. Um, the proposals for new woodland planting to southwest of Turner would effectively screen the development edge of views from the footpath and southwest of the site. Proposed new woodland together with wildflower meadow planting would replace tissues, pony paddocks, etc. So these are potential to avoid and reduce uh, adverse effects. The overall uh, conclusion uh, of that assessment was provided in the um, uh, overarching uh, report to that uh, uh, section, uh, which is 3.96a. That is paginated, uh, it's page 17, and it says Turndon Farm, Reg 18, medium, Reg 19, medium low. And so that's consistent with other sites eradicating, and indeed is perhaps not the one with the uh, uh, highest uh, adverse effect. Um, there is reference, I'm sorry, so I'm still with the a and B's comments, matter seven, issue seven. Uh, I've moved on to um, paragraph 14. And here it's talking about the historic field pattern. Um, and it says sometimes uh, the evidence in terms of the historic uh, landscape is sometimes uh, evidence as retained hedgerow shores, sometimes as gappy hedges or single trees, and sometimes only as ephemeral ditches and hollows. But to the experienced eye, a landscape historian can tell a story of the high world, which once explained can be appreciated by all its residents and visitors. So the majority of remaining features on this land are not only avoided, they are protected and enhanced, and a great number are also restored, particularly in relation to hedgerows and wooded shores and watercourses. Um, so I think it's useful, sir. You were also submitted a, um, a statement uh, by uh, on behalf of uh, Barclay Homes in relation to matter seven, issue seven, uh, by uh, Litchfields, um, and that has an appendix four. I don't know whether you're able to turn that up, but I think it's uh, quite useful um, to uh, look at. And if we just go through that, I'll just uh, so. Page four, there's a single page, and then there's a references the landscape proof of evidence, and there's a contents of what the evidence covered, and we're not going over that. But then you come to a plan, that's, which is um, on my electronic page five, uh, adjacent to 6.1. And this initially shows the site prior to development of both the um, brick kiln farm site to the north and also the Turndon farm site, which has got consent uh, within the site. And you can see the industrial buildings there uh, and the um, sort of menage uh, and all the paddocks and so on. Um, so that gives you an idea of the structure of the site in, in a much clearer uh, situation. Um, I won't go on and talk about that particular development, but this, the, so there's one plan there, but then you come to the electronic page seven, and this shows you the features that are being uh, protected and enhanced and restored. Um, and so the woodland, uh, existing woodland, and this is related to Hennecke's Pit on the farmsteads where the farmsteads no longer there, but ponds are and woodland is, uh, they're being kept and uh, um, uh, enhanced and buffered. Um, the agricultural landscape to the uh, southeast is being retained and enhanced, and historic uh, hedgerows are being replaced. Um, 
between the development area and the that agricultural land that's an important feature um, it connects the ancient woodland of the gill stream with the woodland associated with Henneker's pit and also uh, opens a culverted watercourse so it's restoring principal characteristic owner bee features uh, as part of this uh, plan so you can see the the various hedgerows trees meadows woodland uh, ponds etc uh, are being uh, for the most part retained uh, and enhanced and i think that's uh, an important element of the scheme which is not recognized in the comments um, uh, by the uh, ANB unit. The objection then goes on about urban influences at para 17 uh, and refers to helpfully for, for us, I think, the inspector's decision on Brick Kiln Farm. And it says there that the uh, quotes from the inspector's decision about the proposed allocation is in a self-contained landscape area, which facilitates a substantial extension to Cranbrook with the lowest achievable impact on landscape. The selection of the allocation site, which is largely self-contained in landscapes terms, serves to moderate the harm that development of this scale and any alternative site would call to both the ANB and the historic town centre. The uh, ANB unit objected to that application and appeared at that examination. Um, but the inspector sought fit to grant consent there. Um, and we say uh, that there is some uh, analogous uh, with this uh, allocation in terms of Cranbrook and trying to find the, uh, the next development site. This site is still quite well contained and offers those uh, uh, opportunities about mitigating harm. Um, there's some discussion about uh, 19, para 19, about the effect on the consented scheme for the Turnden farmstead, about how this allocation will undo that uh, uh, allocation. We do not accept that. There is still a substantial landscape setting to the Turnden phase one uh, or the Turnden farmstead scheme, and it is been properly integrated within the allocation. Um, and so it can be taken account of as part of the allocation. Um, in terms of views, paragraph 21, there's concerns about ash dieback. That's a, uh, um, a national issue, not just an ANOB issue or a site specific issue. And again, there is benefits then if that is a site problem of having the site brought into uh, appropriate management. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, ecology. Uh, it was discussed at length at the inquiry, and a number of uh, site specific studies have been done on this site, including the council's own grassland survey, and all those surveys and comments, even from the NAB units appointed witness on grassland, found that the grassland was semi proved species poor. Um, I think so. that's all I want to say about those uh, comments, but most of this has been about the what potential harm there was and what about the mitigation there was. But one of the aspects of this site and is important for planning is the opportunities that it offers. Um, this site does connect existing and proposed development with green routes to promote active travel. There are east-west routes being developed as part of this. It brings significant areas of land and countryside and open space into positive management. You can see the balance of green space and uh, development, which is very, very significant. It improves the quality and extent of public access to green space and natural environment. It provides connections to the consented developments uh, into the landscape through uh, permissive paths and, and improves the connections to those paths that are there. It protects and it strengthens uh, important uh, green corridor for Cranbrook and the Crane Valley and its associated ancient woodland. Uh, it protects and restores important landscape features which have been identified on site and through all the uh, landscape evidence. And it provides for a uh, robust and well-integrated edge of settlement 
similar to the decision made at Brick Kiln Farm. And this edge of settlement is likely to endure as the uh, surrounding green spaces and landscape features are all covered by Section 106 and legal agreements. So they will endure for the lifetime of the development or in effect in perpetuity. So sir, I take you back to the LVIA and say, this is our evidence and it is been considered in some detail and looked at all the pertinent issues raised by objectors to come to a view that this uh, is a suitable site, but it was also taken in the wider issues that the council has to consider in uh, making and putting together a local plan that delivers on local and borough needs. Okay, thank you. A couple of questions then for myself. So, uh, well, three three questions really. So to start with, um, when and, and and this does take us back slightly, but it's it's worthwhile just just summarising um, again. So I've got it um, abundantly clear. When the council re looked at the allocations between Reg eighteen and Reg nineteen. For those allocations that came out at that stage, how did the council determine which of those sites came out? Did you, and, and again, we, we, we talked about this, but did you look at every site again, afresh, and, and just look at them on a site-by-site -site basis? Or did you, as part of that process, um, have in mind the need to, um, you know, have an amount of development in particular locations, or was the strategy almost put to one side and it was just for, um, solely focused on land suitability, suitability of sites? So um, you've had a lot of evidence on that already, I think, and I, I, I don't want to um, uh, uh, go over and say things with other colleagues who might have dealt with that in more detail are not here. So I won't go into too much uh, detail. Um, my clear understanding in terms of the work we've done for the LVAs is that we looked at them afresh. We looked at them. We, we proposed the Reg 18 sites. We agreed with Natural England which sites were considered to be major or likely to be major. And we commissioned LVAs for that. As you have seen through various discussions, some sites were included, even though they weren't uh, major, because we, at the time of starting that work, we included them on a precautionary basis. Um, in terms of looking at the plan as a whole, my understanding is that um, we uh, did a new Sheila, we looked at the sites, we considered all the issues afresh and about whether these sites not only were deliverable in landscape terms, but were sustainable um, and uh, uh, provided the, um, the the benefits that the plan needed to provide. Obviously, you, you mentioned sustainability there, and 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 at, and at the start um, when talking about this, and again, it goes back to the strategy as well. You, you talked about the sustainability of this, you know, of this location, and and how that was taken into account. So in terms of um, in terms of the benefits that this site would have, then what what are they in terms of sustainability? What does this site offer um, as, as a benefit for its um, allocation within the plan in sustainability terms? Then, uh, so sir, it, it, it's been pointed out through the uh, hierarchy of settlements that this is a broadly sustainable settlement. Access is directly onto uh, a main road. Um, there are uh, provision of walking and cycling routes uh, through uh, this site, this allocation, which would encompass the consented scheme on Turndon Farm, but also link to Hartley further to the south um, through the consented development of Brick Kiln and so on into the center of Cranbrook. Um, so it provides that. It does provide, as, as I've said, in terms of opportunities, increased access and uh, amenity into the uh, countryside. It does protect um, the key green corridor or wedge identified both through the neighbourhood plan 
uh, and our work of the uh, Crane Valley. Uh, it's an area of, uh, it's a, uh, a, a, a substantial watercourse. There is a local nature reserve in the uh, close to the town, but the rest of the Crane Valley, which is flanked by ancient woodland, is at the moment unprotected. Um, and the consequence of the brick kiln farm development and this farm brings a substantial amount of that into positive management. Um, it provides a uh, substantial amount of affordable homes uh, for the uh, local area, um, which does have a demand. Um, and so, um, and it's, uh, you'll be aware of the employment site not far away, we discussed the other day at Gills Green, as well as obviously within the town itself. So um, we do consider this a uh, sustainable location and that this development has those sustainability credentials. I said I had three questions, I've got four actually. Oh. <laughs> You, you, you also talked about the um, sort of connectivity then with um, sort of neighbouring sites um, and allocations and, and, and which were approved as well. Is there a plan? I'm not sure whether um, Ms. Marichi might might know this. Is is there a plan within an, either in an adhering statement or evidence submitted which shows then the relationship between the other allocations in the local plan and, and again? you know, looks at connectivity and, and how they sort of sit alongside each other? Uh, I'm looking sir, through the Appendix 4 I referred you to, and I don't think there is a connectivity plan. Um, we did discuss this when we discussed Brick Kiln. Um, and I'm... Uh, ah, uh, uh, hmm. There's a footpath, existing footpath plan. Um so I'm on page 24 of Appendix 4 um, of um, the Statement for Barclay Homes. And uh, I don't know whether you have that, sir, but that shows okay. you... Just, just one second. I'm in the wrong appendix. One second. Uh, Hang on. Appendix 4. four. Okay. Um... Okay, yeah, appendix four on there, page... Page 24. Okay, yeah. So this usually shows, uh, uh, firstly, in blue, the uh, brick kiln farm allocation, which I think is CRS2. Or CRS one, don't mind it around right. And then you've got the Cornhall Oast, uh, which is to the north of that, which is in green. Um, and then we've got the brick kiln, uh, so we've got the Turnden uh, uh, allocation, which is in the red outline, but with the consented scheme in, in Hatch Red. So to the south, we have footpath WC118, which goes through the site, and that's in the area of protected landscape. There will be a, uh, there's provision for a, uh, a footpath to go along the Crane Valley, following the eastern boundary there within the site, connecting to uh, Brickkiln Farm, where there is a continuation of that route and that route then turns into part of a, or connects with a cycleway that connects into the Cornhall Oast site and then connects to where it says P for parking. And that's the car park at the back of the um, supermarket in the center of town. So there will be a connection through there. Um, between the two sites, there are at least, uh, I think it's four points of connection, one right up on the uh, road on the Angley Road, um, one uh, about a third of the way in, which is actually going to be one of the main cycle walking routes. And again, that cuts through both of the sites and that reinstates what was an historic uh, routeway in the Brickcomb Farm site. Then there will be in the middle of the boundary between um, the Turnden site and the Brick Kiln site, there will be another pedestrian connection um, to uh, help with circulation. And then 
we've already covered towards that eastern boundary there is a connection there where another where the access from the Turnden site comes in meets with the, the permissive footpath from the south um, and they go through into the brick kiln farm site so in addition to those sites benefiting from that connection also the settlement of Hartley which you can see to the south uh, west uh, there when if you come along the main road you're uh, restricted to the footway until you get to the Turnden site and then with those provision of footways you'll be able to enter that site and come away from the road and go through green routes into the centre of uh, town. And we had um, discussions on these connectivities and routes um, between the developers for uh, Brickcombe Farm and Turnden with the Parish Council um, to make sure we'd adequately covered um, the concerns about connectivity uh, that were raised. And just before my final question, I don't know whether um, Mr. Marich might know the answer to this. Is is there a is there a sort of indicative layout plan then that shows again how the um, how the sort of proposed areas of residential development for this allocation um, would sort of integrate and sit alongside then um, the 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 other allocations and, and approved schemes? Well, so the answer is there is, but not 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 in the material that's been submitted to you so far. Okay, um, but there are there are there is material that shows um, the relationship between our. Uh, our proposals and Brick Kiln Farm and Turnden Phase One that was submitted as part of the um, urban design proof of evidence at the at the inquiry, um, and was I think updated um, subsequently because. So, if you recall, the I think what happened was that the there was a new reserve matters application made for Brick Kiln Farm, which is now being granted, and that was made during the inquiry. So an inquiry document was submitted, which showed the relationship to the revised um, to the revised reserve matters application that was put in by Hill. Um, so, so there is there, there is such a plan, um, but it's not before you at the moment. And so, similarly, on um, the issue that you asked about access plans, um, there isn't uh, a plan before you that was before the inquiry showing the different access routes. So the only thing you have got, which doesn't is not comprehensive, but so in our uh, hearing statement for this matter at Appendix Five, we have the statement of common ground between Kent County Council uh, and Vectos, who are Barclays Transport Consultants, and so the, the statement of common ground deals with links uh, within and external to the site, including through Brick Kiln Farm and Corn Hall at 3.5 to 3.8. Um, and in addition, what you do have is when you get to the end of the statement of common ground, there are some figures. Um, and the second of those is figure six, which is routes to local amenities. That only shows two routes. One is a blue route um, along um, Hartley Road um, up into town. But the other is the red route that goes through the Brick Kiln Farm scheme. And so you'll see um, on that one, um, that sh does show um, the relationship between our scheme and Brick Kiln Farm. On the, I think that's the previous Reserve Matters application scheme, I, I imagine, because of the timing of this. So have you got figure six? Uh, yeah, so you'll see. I think that is because of the timing of this, I'm pretty sure that's showing the previous reserve matters are proposed along on, um, on, on that site. But so there is one main red route shown that goes up into the town. There were other routes, including a route through Cornhall, um, which are shown indicatively. That's referred to in those paragraphs in the Statement of Common Ground that I mentioned a moment ago. So, so in terms of documentation that you've got before you, I think that's probably what, the, the extent of what we've got. But there certainly are plans that were submitted to the planning inquiry that say if you wanted we could provide that provide more detail both on access routes but also the relationship with brick kiln farm and the revised reserve matters application yeah it sounds like that that plan that shows um the relationship then with the revised scheme 
um, that was produced during an inquiry. I think if you could send that through to the programme officer and we'll get that plan added um, as a um, examination document, just because we've talked about it today. Um, and so I think it'd be useful, um, again, just, just, just again, help, helping me sort of piece it all together to have that plan. Thank um, you, sir. We'll do, we'll do that, sir. We'll do that, yeah. sir. So I think the document I'm referring to may actually be a document produced by Hill, which we submitted, and which they showed our scheme and their scheme together. And okay. Okay, anyway, we'll, we'll submit that document to you. So the, the one that was an inquiry document for the inquiry. The the, the, the the sort of fourth question that I had then about this, and I'll just go back to, um, hang on, it was the, it was your appendix four, um, which was the, I think that was the Pegasus document, isn't it? It was a part of the landscape proof, and but it but it's it, it's it's within you know several several documents, and this is the issue then of um, again the the area that's in the local plan that's identified for residential development. So it's map thirty eight. So um, on map thirty eight, and obviously it's reflected in 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 the design and in the scheme. You've got this setback then from the main road. Um, so again, you've got this sort of this green area before the residential area, and um, just in terms of that very sort of northern and, and northwestern part of the site. Then, and again, maybe for the council to answer in the first instance, what was the what's the reason for that? And so, presumably, is that where the main site access will be? Um, but equally, what was the justification for that setback there, that particular area of the site? Uh, it's reflected in the uh, layout also for Brickkiln Farm, um, and it's it's not covered really very much in the work we discussed uh, and the information you had before you about Brickkiln Farm. Um, but one of the concerns has always been about not uh, just having a bolt on to Cranbrook. Um, that uh, obscured it or um, uh, enveloped it. Um, and there should be a sense of uh, separation to uh, maintain the feeling of the uh, uh, and character of the historic core and also the approach uh, to the settlement. So there are significant green spaces between uh, CRS 1 and 2 uh, and uh, Cranbrook, but also setbacks from the road on both uh, CRS2 and CRS3 um, to preserve that sense of uh, approach to the settlement. And also, so there's not, it, it, would, it, it would reinforce or um, uh, um, undo that sort of sense of separation between Hartley and Cranbrook. So the setback is an important feature it fits in with also the topography because the land falls away as you move away from the main road towards the Crane Valley. And so development doesn't become the prominent uh, feature along the road uh, as it is elsewhere, so that you would end up with a, a feeling of a much larger settlement if it was uh, up against the road frontage. Um, so that's the strategy, both informed by landscape work and by uh, heritage studies that we started with uh, in allocating a brick on farm and we've carried on uh, through uh, the allocation for Turndon. Uh, Mr. Marici. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I was, so I was just going to refer you, sir, to, again, in our, um, in our appendix four, which uh, is what you referred to, Mr. Cook's, uh, extracts from his proof. So if you go to numbered page 59, you should have a figure 41 screened SZTV, including phase two, not, not to scale. So, so um, when you find that, um, you'll see what's reflected on that drawing is we have the approved outline parameters for Brick Kiln Farm shown in orange. Um, and so you'll see, obviously they haven't changed, just, just the reserve matters. Uh, there's a setback um, to the road. 
which we match. If you can see below, obviously our scheme is um, illustrated by the sort of pink um, uh, square houses shown. We've matched that setback. Uh, and similarly, so you'll also see uh, as you move towards the middle of the development, there's a green space in the middle of the brick kiln farm development, a sort of green route um, in, into the middle. And, and obviously we reflect that going south by having a, a green route and uh, restored uh, woodland planting, et cetera, uh, through the middle of that to sort of match the um, green area in, in, in the middle. And so the other thing about the setback is that, um, I think Mr. Scully referred to this briefly earlier, one of the proposals is to restore a historic routeway called Tanner's Lane. Um, and that, sir, is up in that, um, in that corner uh, where the setback is. So obviously the setback itself allows for the restoration of Tanner's Lane as a, a, foot, a historic footpath that's being restored that takes you into, um, uh, into Cranbrook. And so that's another reason for this for, for this for the setback that we that we have but obviously it it matches what's have been consented at brick kiln farm um, and it is to there was obviously discussion at the inquiry about the extent to which there are views from the road uh, of the two schemes um, and the setback was a mitigation um, that reduced any visual impact um, of development from, from the road so so thank you Uh, Mr. Watson. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I hesitate to intervene since uh, Mr. Scully has been dealing with uh, objections raised by the high wheeled AONB rather than anything CPRE contributed. But I, I hope I can usefully make one or two comments. And that the first is that um, uh, I'm sure you'll look at the uh, statement by. Um, the high wheel AONB uh, as a whole, uh, notwithstanding the, the absence from the hearing of their representative due to illness. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, we, uh, in common with um, uh, Barclays, uh, represented by Litchfield, have provided uh, links or copies to various documents that were submitted in the Turnden inquiry. Um, all of those doc, all the documents in that inquiry are available on the council's website, and it, it seems to me you might usefully uh, look at those which haven't been formally drawn to your attention, as well as those that have. Um, I think it would be fair to say that most, if not all, of the expert evidence that um, Mr. Scully uh, and uh, Mr. Marici have mentioned uh, this morning uh, was. Um, contested in the course of the tendered inquiry by um, either expert evidence or the lived experience of local people who provided um, uh, evidence at the inquiry uh, and all that is available to you. Um, I, I can't speak for the other parties, um, but in our closing uh, statement, uh, which um, uh, is appended to our hearing statement, um, uh, we I endeavoured to give our take on how matters stood on those matters. Um, you'll, you'll appreciate that um, uh, none of those who objected to the inquiry are able to devote the time, resources or budget to um, uh, either that inquiry or, or this proceeding that um, that Farkley and the council are able to do. Um, I think I, I would, if I may make a, a couple of specific points, uh, it, Mr. Scully in, in, in describing the um, impact of the proposal, so of the allocation on the landscape, did, did refer to um, Litchfield's um, appendix four, and in particular to a map that showed the um, uh, the way in which the undeveloped area would be laid out and managed. And I, I, I think it's true to say that, I mean, th those are um, Barclay specific proposals in the application. Um, that not all of that is or can be um, guaranteed by the, um, uh, the, the policy we're, we're looking at now, which, which is much briefer and in more general terms uh, in its references to green infrastructure and so forth. So, probably you, you shouldn't assume that matters would be 
uh, called that the policy guarantees all, all the measures that um, Barclays put forward. Um, in relation to the connectivity um, and the links with neighboring settlements, um, I, I may have misunderstood which, which map was being referred to, but uh, I, I was looking at the, um, the, the Crown Brook policies um, map um, from the local plan. Um, and I, I think that shows two things which have of relevance that have arisen. One is that it shows quite clearly that the, the three proposals looked at together of um, uh, uh, Turndon, sorry, the three allocations looked at together, Turndon, Brickhill Farm and Corn Hall, um, unquestionably attached to the settlement of Cranbrook, uh, what is currently um, an isolated farmstead. Uh, I should say an isolated former farmstead, Turndon, uh, on which um, a consented development is now taking place, which is being marketed as a farmstead development. Um, it is substantially on the site of the former farmstead buildings. Um, the, the, the second point is, is that Mr. Scully mentioned the importance of the setback and the green strip between the Angley Road, Hartley Road, A229, and both uh, Turndon Farmstead, uh, the proposed uh, Turndon Farm development and Brick Kiln Farm, um, and how that uh, maintains the, in his view, the, the separation between Hartley to the southwest and Crown Rook to the northeast. Um, the point uh, I would make it is it is a very tenuous separation, and, and it depends upon the observer of the landscape recognizing that um, the green gap, as, as I think the landscape expert, Mr. Cook, uh, who uh, gave evidence on behalf of Barclay, the inquiry, described as the, 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 the landscape flowing over um, what is described in material before you as the ribbon development of Orchard Way, um, which is between Turndon Road and uh, both uh, Turn Turndon Road and the High Street on the, on the northwest side of, of Angley Road. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it is not a, a, a concept, I think, this flowing over that, that, that most non-specialists would would comprehend um, what, what remains if it, truly green is a, a very narrow group of fields to the northwest of the um, uh, of the A two two nine and and the strip of green which is retained um, between the Angley Road and the proposed development area, um, which viewed from the road will not look very substantial, uh, and then the um, the narrow field in what one might call the extreme, the, 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 the southwestmost point at which the, um, uh, the, the, the allocation of Turndon uh, reaches the, the ribbon development at Hartley. So the, at the very least, the, the separation is, is very greatly reduced. Um, in our view, it is to all practical purposes eliminated, but we are not, of course, landscape experts in the way that um, uh, Barclay's expert witness was. Uh, the final point I, I could make if I, no, I'd like to make, make two points if I can. Uh, the connectivity um, issue, um, everything that was said is, is, is correct in terms of routes, but uh, I would make the point that the connectivity still depends upon the developers of the separate sites, um, connecting them up in the way that is envisaged. Um, there is a reserve matters uh, permission granted now for Brick Kiln Farm uh, that, that may achieve a certain amount and enable the, um, uh, the those who live in a future development of Turndon, should it happen, to um, go through Brick Kiln Farm and up onto Crownbrook High Street um, at the um, the point that's indicated on the policies plan. 
what the any future development of Cornhall will do, if anything, um, it is unknown to any of us. Uh, as, as I said at the previous hearing, nothing has come forward in public about the development of Cornhall since that time. Um, finally, Mr. Scully did, did refer to the sustainability of the site. Um, I think it is fair to say that quite substantial points were made by members of the local community during the inquiry that one should not expect a great deal of use to be made of public transport by um, future residents of Turndon, um, given that the public transport option is a couple of, um, well, one, uh, uh, bus services we, we, which don't run terribly frequently and don't run terribly often. Also, the, the sheer distance from uh, Turnden to the centre of Cranbrook, which is apparent from the um, the plan, um, suggests that uh, many residents, so particularly those perhaps with small children or heavy uh, uh, shopping to carry or whatever it might be, will will, will continue to choose the. Um, their cars when making local journeys. Um, those are the points I'd like to make arising what's been on from what's been touched on so far. Thank you. Oh, mute. Okay, we'll go to Mr. Scully first and then uh, Mr. Marine afterwards. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, Firstly, just in terms of uh, things being contested at the uh, examination, it's important to note that um, the A and a B unit did not contest any of the biodiversity evidence, uh, which were uh, quite a lot of related to the uh, mitigations that we've talked about in terms of woodland and shores being created and hedgerows and so on. Um, and we suggested that they uh, gave uh, some considerable weight to the scheme because it, it was uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was a, a genuine gain, these features that are gonna lift, um, be in perpetuity and not the 30 years that potential offsite um, uh, enhancements would, would be able to achieve through the Emerging uh, Environment Act. Um, but also the gains were very specific and aligned to the ANAB management plan. So they made direct contributions to the objectives of the ANAB management plan. There's a whole schedule of that work uh, that was produced and that was not contested by Natural England. Um, and that the biodiversity net gain was, uh, uh, you know, as we've suggested, strongly integrated uh, with the uh, development. Um, the allocation plan itself, map 38, does show all the connections that um, uh, we were discussing and, and how they connect to the different sites. Um, that has been taken account of in the reserve matters for the um, uh, brick kiln farm site. And obviously it forms part of this uh, policy uh, here. In terms of what the policy says about uh, this scheme, the map is quite clear about the developable areas. And it does uh, also have relevant criteria about protecting and enhancing existing features and meadows and woodlands and so on. So we, we are happy to look at that. And, and if, if there are suggestions about how that may be strengthened, but I think what the application has shown is, is both that that policy is, is uh, robust uh, and uh, um, suitable for the site and is deliverable and shows the scheme is deliverable um, in terms of uh, viability and the uh, policy requirements. So I think that's uh, uh, important to note. There was also a point raised about the um, uh, how the gap will be perceived by people. That is important. Um, that's part of the rationale of the work we, we've, we've done. But you should note between the development and viewers along the road, there will be um, hedgerows and trees and woodland planting. They're all affecting the outlook um, and the character and context of the area to reinforce uh, the greenness of that corridor in proximity to the viewers. Thank you, sir. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Marucci. So um, what I wanted to do, sir, if, you, if you're content with this, was uh, just to make a handful of further points about um, some of the representations from the AOMB unit. And so what I was gonna mostly do, sir, was refer you to documents that are attached to our hearing statement and where they deal with some of the points that have been raised. If I may do that, sir, um, there's a handful of them, sir. But, so first of all, sir, I, I must just uh, raise this, sir, about the AOMB unit's objection, sir. In our closing speech uh, for the inquiry, which you have at Appendix 7 to our hearing statement, in a number of paragraphs, we did raise issues about the position that was taken by the AOMB unit and, particular, and in particular the director, Sally Marsh, um, given the fact that she was a local resident who lived very close to the site. Um, so, so that's paragraphs 20, 21, <coughs> 34, 60 and 92 that raise concerns about the AOMB unit's position. So I'll just leave that with you so I don't go further into that. So on sustainability, uh, which was, I think, referred to a moment ago by Mr. Wooten, um, so just two things to refer you to. One is paragraph 77 of our closing, which is Appendix 7, which sets out the sort of key points around the transport sustainability of the site. But also, so in our Appendix 5 to the hearing statement, that's the statement of common ground between the transport consultants and the highway authority. Section three comprehensively looks at the sustainability credentials of the site in terms of um, accessibility to services and buses, et cetera. Um, so thirdly, so there is a point made um, in paragraph 25 of the representations made by the AOMB unit. Um, and so um, I just mentioned it, um, I think we, it may have been discussed before uh, in the context of this examination, um, but what's said there in paragraph 25, and correctly said, is that the major development test um, in the MPPF isn't directly applicable to local plan examinations. I think I may have made this point before when we discussed um, issue five, I think it was, but um, because it's actually a development control test. Um, and that has been held to be the case by the Court of Appeal in the Wielden um, case. So it's not actually directly a test that does apply at the examination stage, but it is nonetheless relevant, of course, to you, sir, because if it's major development and it could and it and it wouldn't get permission because it doesn't wouldn't meet the tests for major development, then obviously it wouldn't be deliverable and that would affect its soundness. But so that's how it comes in. So I just wanted to be clear that that was the position. So for, fourthly, um, there is extensive reference in the representations made by the AOMB unit to historic fieldscape issues. Um, and um, there are a number of places where that's picked up. And so that was again discussed at the inquiry. And I would refer you in our closing in Appendix 7 to paragraphs 47, Roman 1, uh, and 68 to 72, but also, sir, paragraph three um, of, of the closing, so 347.1 and 68.72, we summarise there the extensive evidence given by Dr Chris Mealy um, on the historic landscape issue, whether there is a historic landscape. And that also looks at some of the documents that are directly before you in the evidence base, like the LUC report, which is what we refer to in paragraph three of the closing. That report found there was no remaining historic fieldscape within the appeal site. Uh, and so the points also made there, of course, that one of the proposals that we're making is for the restoration of hedgerows, which will reflect the historic fieldscape position that's been lost, uh, particularly in the fields of the south. Uh, so then fifthly, sir, um, you asked some questions about this earlier, the HDA assessment and the criticisms that have been made of that um, by um, the AONB unit. So um, obviously on that, as indeed with everything else, we agree with what was said by Mr. Scully, but can I add just two small points, almost footnotes to that really? Um, so the first of all is that as you know, sir, that HDA assessment was in particular commissioned between Reg 18 and Reg 19 to deal with sites that were either absolutely major development or could be considered to be major development on a precautionary basis. And the reason that was done was that Natural England requested that for any site that was or was or could be major development, that there be a full LVIA undertaken. And obviously that was what was done. 
And then so secondly, the sort of second footnote on the HDA assessment uh, is that so in our closing, Appendix 7, paragraph 137, we make reference to an appeal decision in, in, in the immediate vicinity, the Gale Farm decision, where uh, one of your fellow inspectors gave weight to the HDA assessment as an up-to-date professional assessment that could be um, uh, given uh, weight in, 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 in the assessment. So, so those are the one two footnotes on the HDA assessment. I suppose the other point I should just make on that, sir, is that you'll know that obviously we had our own witness at the inquiry. You'll have seen you've got extracts. We looked at them earlier from our um, proof of evidence, which is Appendix 4, Mr Cook's evidence. And so what you'll see is that Mr Cook's conclusions, which you've got in there, um, mirror very closely the conclusions reached by the HDA. So, so that's all I had on, on the HDA assessment. So just a handful of other things, if I, if I may. Um, separation between settlements, that's obviously raised by the AMB unit in their objection. And again, sir, um, if you look at our closing speech, Appendix 7, it's paragraphs 11 and 45 uh, in particular um, that deal um, uh, with that. So it's a paragraph, and, and it's also so pages 34 to 35 of their numbered pages of the closing deal um, with this issue about separation of settlements. And then so one other uh, issue that's related to that, not quite the same, and it's been mentioned, I think, by Mr. Wooden this morning, is whether the, the proposals uh, for phase two fit with the design ethos for phase one. Um, and so that's dealt with in our closing paragraph 11, sub one, page seven, uh, we deal with that. And then Sir Ash Dieback, which again has been, I think, covered by Mr Scully this morning. Again, so just I simply say, so our, our closing speech, page 36, footnote 256, summarises the evidence and the position on Ash Dieback as an issue. Um, and then so the last um, three small points, ecology and biodiversity. So that's our closing 92 to 103. Um, there were two expert witnesses, Mr. Scully for the council, Mr. Goodwin um, for ourselves. No expert ecological witness was called by any other party, although Ms. Marsh for the OMB unit did give evidence. And as Mr. Scully said, Natural England raised no objection. Although they were at the inquiry, obviously on landscape issues, they raised no objections on biodiversity issues at all uh, in relation to the scheme. Um, and then, um, so the restoration of historic field boundaries, which I mentioned. So you've got that, uh, again, if you look at Appendix 4, uh, which is Mr Cook's proof, he has some plans in there, various plans which show uh, the restoration of those features and why they would be a benefit. And then so I think the final point um, is Mr Wooden raised, how would connectivity be secured between Brick Kiln Farm, our site, and, and the town, and Corn Hall, given that there uh, are different developers in play. So that was an issue at the inquiry. It's dealt with in our closing speech at footnote nine, page two. Um, I won't go through all the points, uh, but there are conditions uh, already attached to the Brick Kiln Farm permission um, dealing with some of this. Um, and um, in addition, so there was a, an issue raised about whether there was a ransom strip which was disputed, but in any event, the majority of the links, I think um, three of the four, were not affected um, by this alleged ransom issue. But so we've set out the evidence very briefly in a, in a, in a footnote um, at, page, at, page, at page two, footnote nine, just to deal with that point that Mr Wooden raised. So, so thank you, those are, those are the points I wanted to add. Otherwise, we entirely agree with everything Mr Scully has, has, has said and simply add those points. So thank you, sir. Um, one sort of final um, query from, from me, really, and, and then we'll maybe sort of have a quick look at the, um, the actual word in the policy. Um, you, you, you're right about the, um, the, the, the test within the framework, and this is something we've, we've discussed, and it's the paragraph 177, isn't it, um, around the exceptional circumstances. Um, in considering, um, and it's the second point, isn't it? It's the sort it's of cost of and, and scope for developing outside the designated area or meeting the need in, in some other way. 
what did the um, what did the appeal proposals, the the, um, the proposals that were subject to the inquiry, how did they approach that then? So in terms of this issue about the cost of and scope for developing outside the designated or meeting the need in some other way, how, how did the council and and the site promoters approach that? Was was there an agreed approach on um, on on the position? How you would actually consider that test? Where you, you know where you'd look to see if housing could be housing needs could be met in in some other way? How did you how did you approach and how did you sort of tackle the one power one seven seven tests? Well, so um, um, the, the the best place to see to see it uh, is probably in Appendix 3 uh, to our hearing statement, which is the extract from Mr. Slapgood's proof at page 53 um, onwards, uh, he addresses that cost of and scope for developing outside the designated area um, test. So the first thing is it was a matter of uh, effectively that we agreed with the council. So it was dealt with through statement of common ground as to how, how this would be approached. But what we did, was really twofold. We relied on the council's work for the purposes of this plan to, uh, in the sense that they'd gone through this whole exercise and had identified our site as a site for allocation. So we relied on all of that work. Um, and then what we did was we uh, supplemented that work um, by looking in particular at other sites in and around Cranbrook in, in more detail. And so we did that both through Mr. Slapford's evidence and also Mr. Cook's evidence, just to look at some particular alternatives that were um, suggested. And so we also looked at and considered the neighborhood plan uh, evidence as well that had looked at various sites at, at various um, points. But so the, the, the position that we, we was obviously taken was that, so in, again, I think this is covered also in the in the closing and I'll give you the rest as well in a moment, but, um, uh, so it's paragraph one, two, two. So I think of our, of our closing. Uh, if you just give me one moment. Yes. Yeah, so, so one, two, two onwards. We deal with um, paragraph one, seven, seven B and alternatives. And obviously, so that we address in paragraph one, two, three the Wielden um, case, um, which makes clear that there is actually a very wide margin of appreciation for the decision maker as to how you look at alternatives for the purposes of that test. It's not sort of mandated or, or, or restricted. Um, and then you, so you'll see the way that we sort of map through it. We look at what the legal position is in one, two, three. Um, in one, two, four, um, we look at the constraints there are borough wide uh, in terms of AOMB, uh, in terms of uh, other restrictions including green belt. So then we look at um, uh, the burden of proof on that. And then at one, two, six, um, we look at, in particular, sites in and around Cranbrook. Uh, and obviously, so the, one of the reasons we focused on that was obviously there's a recognition that there is a housing need, not just district-wide, but also in Cranbrook, of course. Um, and I think you've been referred previously to the neighbourhood plan evidence, which again is attached to our hearing statement at uh, Appendix 8. And that, at page 106, refers to an independent housing need assessment by ACOM, that concluded that there was a need for additional 610 homes by 2033. Um, and I mean, that was obviously focusing on, on, on Cranbrook in, in, in particular. Um, and so we then um, pick up other issues around the uh, limitations of other sites that were available. And so that, that goes on in a number of paragraphs right through, I think, to um, page um well, so i think certainly page 99 so dealing with alternatives so so there was an there was a, a degree of agreement between ourselves and the council uh, about how this was approached uh, we did rely heavily on the evidence base that you have before you same evidence base we also did some supplementary work uh, as well um to to support that um and so in, in addition um, obviously the the main party that took the issue about alternatives was actually Natural England. Um, but so their main point was, 
we shouldn't place too much reliance on the evidence base for the examination because that was a matter for you, sir, rather than for the inspector at the inquiry. And their view was it was better that this site, if it's going to be released, be released through your process rather than the inquiry. They didn't call any sort of detailed evidence on alternatives. That was their kind of broad brush point. So, so I hope that assists. I'm happy to assist further if I can. I think Mr Scully's got his hand up as well. So. Um, just before I go back to Mr. Scully, um, a, a, a sort of question really, um, see, see your views on this, because it's a question that I asked um, I asked people, I can't remember if you were there actually, I'm not sure if you were, but maybe you were, so apologies if you, if you were, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of people over the last um, four weeks at this examination. Um, paragraph 11 of the framework um, mm. talks about plan making. And, and, and this is an issue that, that has cropped up um, sort of in, in the early stages of, of the examination, but appreciate sort of your, your views on this as well. Um, we, paragraph 11 then um, states, plans and decisions should apply presumption in favour of sustainable development. Uh, for plan making, uh, this means, and it sets out A and B. So part B, it says strategic policy should as a minimum provide for objective assessed needs for housing and other uses, as well as any needs that cannot be met within neighboring areas. And, and, we've, and we've talked a lot about that. Unless the application of policies in this framework that protect areas or assets of particular importance provides a strong reason for restricting the overall scale type or distribution of development. And then there's the footnote and we go down to the footnote and it says, policies are referred to in this framework include um, several things, green belt, and that was a lot of the, the topic of conversation, but it also says an area of outstanding natural beauty. So what, and this, and this is a question that I sort of posed um, at, at earlier sessions, what do you think the framework is saying in that context? Is it directing plan makers to, um, to essentially avoid green belts and AOMBs? Is it saying that they provide a strong reason for, for not meeting housing needs? Um, what, what are your views on that? Because there's, there's been representations um, at a strategic level, but they apply to sites like this to say, well, um, you know, it's a very constrained borough and there's lots of AOMB. Therefore, you know, we, we shouldn't be allocating sites like this because if we can't meet our needs, um, then actually that's what the framework talks about. So just yes, so I mean, I so I would say um, that the position um, must be analogous um, to how this operates in relation to development controls, which obviously the footnote also applies. Um, and so that is that um, what it probably is directing you to do is to consider whether the tests um, that are set in respect to those specific matters covered by the footnote are met in relation to a, a site. So, so here, you, that, that effectively means, you know, obviously this is major development um, and it should only be permitted um, in exceptional uh, circumstances. So you have to reach a view about whether that's a case that's got a reasonable prospect of being made on a planning application because otherwise the site wouldn't be deliverable. But so if you take the view that that, that is the position, that there is a, a reasonable case that can be made, that there are exceptional circumstances for the release of this site, um, then in my submission, it obviously is, um, it, 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 the case would be that there is no clear reason for uh, refusal on the basis of those policies and therefore no reason why the site couldn't be allocated. So, so my position would be, it operates in this way, not to say, you don't have to um, meet needs, you don't have to look at sites in those areas. But I suspect what it's really doing is directing you that if you are looking at sites in those areas of allocation, you have to consider the relevant policies in the MPPF in detail, or, or at least be to consider them to the degree of being, being uh, satisfied that there's a reasonable prospect that, that the development could come forward under those tests. So here, it, it would simply mean that there are exceptional circumstances. I mean, so, so obviously for, for Greenbelt, the position is of course different because there is a specific test within the MPPF, as we all know, uh, for release from the Greenbelt, um, in addition to a, a different test for the grant of planning permission for inappropriate um, development. There, there's no similar breaking down of the position for AOMBs and national parks. That, that doesn't happen in that way. But so nonetheless, I would say what this is doing is directing you to consider those policy tests 
um, in paragraph 177 in relation to any site that's allocated that is major development. You have to be satisfied that there's a reasonable prospect those tests could be met um, so that the site is deliverable. But if that is met, then in, in my submission, effectively any prohibition from the footnote falls away because there wouldn't be a clear reason for refusal based on it. So that, that's the approach I would take so, to that. So, so I would agree with that. Um, paragraph 11, of course, is looking at um, the plan holistically. It's not in any way raising some kind of uh, presumption against meeting uh, the needs, the development needs of the borough uh, in the event that the borough has within it significant constraints like AOMB. Um, <clears throat> what it's saying is, um, if having considered the opportunities available in the AOMB, uh, you don't think uh, that it's appropriate having regard to the particular circumstances of any particular um, allocation um, that uh, the overall needs identified should be met um, because of that, then that might provide a reason for not meeting those needs. Uh, but it is not precluding the contribution which sites in the AOMB might make to meeting those needs. That's the first point. I think the second point is that one has to consider also uh, in the context of meeting need, uh, how and where those needs arise. And in, in the context of Cranbrook and also Hawkshurst for that matter, um, development sites as they come forward to meet need on a more local level, including the provision of affordable housing uh, within the smaller settlements, entirely covered uh, or surrounded by AOMB. It is inevitable um, that consideration will be given to the release of such sites. Um, but otherwise, I, I, I'm happy to accept everything Mr. Morici says. So for the council's position then, um, presumably uh, the council, if the council had gone through this process and, and hadn't identified appropriate sites within the AOMB or sites that the council considered could meet the tests of 177. So, um, you know, the council had gone through the process and gone through the Sheila process and, 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 the, and the detailed LVIA work and said, look, you know, they're just not, you know, they're, they're, they're really just not suitable. We can't see a reason um, for allocating these sites. Then potentially that's when you would get into your 11B to say, well, we simply can't meet our needs um, in, a, in a sustainable and appropriate way because, look, we've looked at all these sites. They're not going to meet paragraph 177 you know, the significant harm, et cetera, et cetera. So that's then when you'd be in a situation, obviously in front of, of an inspector sort of say, we simply can't meet these needs, we're into paragraph 11B. But actually the council's position is they haven't reached that stage. They've done that first stage of looking at sites, looking at the green belt, and we talked about the green belt assessments, looking at the AOMB and actually concluded that, that housing needs could be met through appropriate allocations. You've articulated what I said in a very practical way, yeah. and that is the, that, that, that is the position. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Mr. Water, and then we'll come back to Mr. Scully. Thank you. So did, just to say briefly, because I don't pretend the expertise on planning law that uh, others do, simply that they the thesis behind uh, CPRE Kent's uh, comments on the plan as a whole is, is, is to the effect that the, the council have not given the weight they should to the duty to protect the AONB and to the protection of the green belt in, in, in the, the approach to allocations. And, and that is one of the underlying reasons why uh, we oppose uh, the allocation of this site among others. Um, uh, I, could I also say that um, in our closing in the um, tender inquiry, we also addressed the question of uh, section 177 um, in paragraphs 8.6 to 8.19 uh, and referring into earlier to evidence given in the course of the inquiry by uh, Councillor Nancy Warren, um, who is a, a the local councillor for um, Cranbrook and Sissinghurst, and also now the deputy leader of the council, who had uh, at 
various relevant times also have been involved with the neighborhood development plan group for Cranbrook and Sissinghurst, in which you addressed the history of the um, allocation or non-allocation of various sites in the in the parish. Um, uh, not all of which were addressed in um, the, the evidence that um, Barclay's expert witness uh, put forward. Um, the, the existence of alternative sites in the vicinity uh, continues to be demonstrated by uh, the applications that come forward, and three of which are, I believe, at least three of which within the parish are subject to current uh, planning appeals. Um, uh, which have yet to be determined. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scully. Uh, just in relation to our overall approach to the issues you've raised, which is that you've discussed uh, at some length now with uh, both the advocates, of course, the development strategies topic paper uh, does deal with this issue. Um, Mr. Meech is right in terms of uh, the agreements between the Council and Barclay Homes in terms of the statement of common ground for the inquiry, but obviously the Council also came to its own view in uh, recommending the application for approval and it was approved and there is a committee report for that that sets out the Council's approach to these issues. Um, that can be provided to you if you wish because that gives the most uh, clearest indication uh, as what has been said. Uh, in relation to the statutory duty, rather than necessarily the guidance uh, in the MPPF, this is also uh, covered uh, in the um, uh, uh, in the uh, distribution and development uh, topic paper. Um, and in particular, uh, we look at the um, Natural England guidance. Uh, the, which covers the statutory duty on page 41, um, and in particular, paragraph 6.118. Um, the guidance is England's statutory landscape designations, a practical guide to your duty of regard, Natural England 2010. And it does say on the subsequent page, decisions and actions taken by relevant authorities will invariably require a wide range of factors and issues to be taken into account. The duty requires this process should include consideration of potential impacts on A and OB national parks purposes, with the expectation that adverse impacts will be avoided or mitigated where possible. We do say we have done both of those. And provided this is done, the duty has been met, irrespective of whether or not the decision ultimately taken conflicts with A and OB national park purposes. Um, so I'd also uh, refer to you in terms of the particular part of uh, Power 177, the cost and scope for developing outside the designated area or meeting the need for it in some other way, to the decision, recent decision at Hawkehurst in relation to one of our allocated sites south of Coptal Avenue. You've been referred to this before on several times, um, and that addresses the issue uh, in paragraphs 125 to 128, uh, where the inspector goes through in quite short shrift the issues around alternative sites, the fact that Hawkehurst, very similar to Cranbrook, is entirely within the area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, and his conclusion was, based on the evidence before me, I consider there is no clear scope for developing outside the designated area or meeting the council needs in some other way. Okay, thank you. Yes, if you could, um, is the committee report within any of the statements or documents? No, no sir, I don't believe it is. Um, but to say we can certainly provide a public document and so yeah. we can provide it. Okay, yes, please. Um, okay, they were the only questions that I had. I do just want to quickly go through and have a quick look at the um, the development requirements and the policy, but I'm probably going to suggest we take a quick comfort break if that's okay. Yes, um, yeah, we take a sort of five minute break. And uh, so we, I, I don't have any more questions. I just want to sort of 
quickly go through the, the development policy requirements. I don't envisage there being too much longer, um, but we'll take a, a five minute break if that's okay um, and, and adjourn just until until five two, um, please. Thank you.
Okay, thanks everyone. We'll uh, resume and continue. Um, I just want to go through the development requirements in the local plan then um, to finish off with. Um, so obviously we talked, um, talked a lot about sort of the, the, the reasons and rationale for the site layout plan on um, map 38, isn't it, within the local plan page 187. Um, Mr Scully, you talked about um, the sort of importance of um, the areas of, of open space and um, and, and um, sort of retaining them in perpetuity, et cetera. Do you think that the local plan will be effective in doing that? So obviously put the put the current scheme sort of um, to one side for a moment, if there was potentially, a, a, you know, a revised scheme or something that comes forward in the future. Um, does the um, plan and do the development requirements effectively um, control um, the sort of issues that you've been talking about this morning? Uh, the main mechanism we use in order to secure this is a landscape and ecological management plan, uh, which is referred to elsewhere in, in policy, uh, but that's uh, criterion eight. It does make it clear it's to cover all the public spaces, retained and restored habits and any retained agricultural land. I suppose to uh, um, avoid any risk that uh, there might be an approach to limit the extent of that, um, we could add in for the lifetime of the development. Um, but to that wording, uh, in general, we cover that through uh, the Section 106 agreement that um, ties the uh, LEMP to the development. But, uh, I, you know, I'd be grateful for any um, advice you have on uh, ensuring that this is what happens. And just looking at the requirements, is there anything in there? I'm just re reading and speaking at the same time. Um, but is there anything in there that talks about future management maintenance of these areas then? Well, that that's the um, uh, the LEMPSA, those say criterion eight. Um, uh, and it, it, it and, and it refers back to BS um, 402020. Um, biodiversity in relation to development. Um, uh, and that's, I say, the method we've used uh, on uh, and continues to use on, 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 a, on a daily basis. Um, and it sets out there the provision of an adherence to. So um, we need to have it provided and we need to have it followed uh, to cover all public spaces, um, retained and restored habits and any retained agricultural land. Um, it doesn't prevent um, uh, things happening on the land. It just means we've got control over its, its uh, future management and, uh, as a land use. And we can ensure, that's the, the important thing, is about ensuring that the objectives in terms of landscape and ecology that are set out within an application and within the policy are, you know, um, uh, continued through uh, in the long term. Then, in terms of the um, some of the accessibility um, issues that we've been talking about, again, let's just have a quick look. Then, so what does it require in terms of firstly, sort of connectivity, and also secondly, it's sort of integration then with um, with neighbouring developments. So the plan, first of all, we have Map Thirty Eight site layout plan, um, and that indicates. Uh, uh, it says indicative access, shows public right of way, and it shows pedestrian links, importantly. And then we have uh, criterion two, um, which apart from the uh, um, vehicular access coming from, uh, so first of all, it says safe and non-vehicular routes for pedestrians and cyclists through the site connecting to, and point one is the footway on Hartley Road, that's the main road to the west. Um, so that uh, people can connect that safely. Uh, criterion two is a corresponding route on the allocated sites to the north, uh, at CRS one, CRS two, and that's the blue connecting arrows on the northeastern boundary, which connect with um, uh, CRS two. And the item three is existing pipes. And so this is improvements to the existing public rightsway network to the south. And you can see the public right of way that cuts through the site. And then criterion three, improvement to public rights away within the site. 
I, I think um, what's missing there is really the provision of the link along the crane brook. If I think about it, it should say I'm just seeing if it covers it anywhere else. Ah, um, no, it does. Sorry, it's covered in uh, Criterion 7A. It says a infrastructure, a link along the Crane Valley to link into the routes provided further north along the valley, providing an extended and improved green route into the centre of Cranbrook. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, just in terms of Ms. Marici on, on behalf of the site promoters, is there anything, um, again, in terms of, sort of effectiveness of the requirements which you sort of seeking to change? Um, so I don't, I don't think there is uh, such a, we made some very small, I think, um, proposals to amend uh, wording um, on six and seven, but so it is very minor. I think uh, on six, which says development shall be located on the areas identified for residential use. We wanted something like um, broadly or generally in accordance because the plan is quite high level about where the exact development lies, but so it's not a big point. And then seven, so on 7D, reinstatement of historical field boundaries with hedgerow shores and woodlands, I think we wanted uh, the wording where it's appropriate to do so. And um, obviously there are places where it isn't, but um, but so again, it's not a big point. And broadly, we are content with the terms of the policy in terms of effectiveness and, and what it requires. Just in terms of the site layout plan then, on other allocations, we've we talked again talked at, at length about this, and we talked about um, introducing a, um, a modification into the plan, just, just again, just to sort of clarify that these site layout lands are indicative. And in a lot of cases, you know, the very specific detail will come forward to the plan application stage. And, and, and one of the issues is, is simply the scale of the plans, um, especially for a lot smaller allocations. This allocation does have criterion six in development shall be located in areas identified for residential use on the site layer plan. Is that um is that repeated on other allocations? I'm not sure if it is. No, I, I checked. So this is a matter of what we, we have discussed uh, uh, on, uh, particularly at the beginning of the inquiry and subsequently on, on most of the sites with these plans. Uh, we are looking to make sure either within the policy or in the uh, uh, overarching text uh, for the allocation plans that we make it clear that these plans are indicative because as you say the scale of them is such that it's impossible to be entirely accurate um, and also um, it's uh, you know the details matters as they arrive may well provide good arguments and uh, for uh, a bit of pushing and shoving on those uh, boundaries as well so we do recognize that uh, we've accepted that elsewhere and uh, through the review that um, uh, if we proceed to modifications, uh, we will uh, set out a consistent approach on that issue. So just on this particular site then, might, might six might need some tweaking then maybe? It, it may be perfectly easy to delete it. So if we've covered it for all maps yeah. and all sites elsewhere in the plan, uh, we, we, it might be easier to make sure we delete all those references. Um, as long as you have it somewhere else. Um, it, it does occur elsewhere, actually. Paragraph 6 is used in other, uh, other allocations, so we need to uh, check that quite carefully so we have consistency. Yeah, it's just a point of internal consistency. I think if you've got, if you've got it set out um, elsewhere in the plan um, and not every allocation has that, then it might just be a case of, of deleting them because, like I say, it'd be, it'd be set out elsewhere in the plan anyway. Yeah, exactly. So I don't have any objection to Mr. Marici's um, suggestion in relation to 7D. So that would be aware appropriate or where necessary or something similar. Yes. Yep. 
Yeah, I'm fine with both of those. Um, Mr. Watson. Thank you, sir. I, may I just draw your attention to CPRE Kent's um, comments on the pre submission local plan in relation to this policy, which are on the material part is on pages 54 and 55 of our pre submission local plan comments, um, in which we said uh, that. Um, if the um, policy is not removed from the plan, which was our principal submission, um, there are a number of changes that we thought should be made. Um, those that are still potentially relevant are as follows. Uh, a requirement to adopt a design which respects the original farmstead character of Turndon uh, and the heritage asset of the ruins of formerly grade two listed turned in. Uh, a requirement that spoil from the development not be spread on the undeveloped part of the site. Th this was an issue discussed in some detail in the inquiry. It, it is um, Barclay's proposal to, to spread the spoil on um, the uh, part of the green area. And that there was discussion of the impact that would have on ecology and landscape. Um, a requirement to comply with the high wheeled AONB design guide, um, a requirement to conduct a comprehensive traffic survey and implement remedial measures as appropriate, um, and to include references to policies EN21 and EN22, that's in relation to air quality and the AQMA, uh, in the list of relevant policies at the end of the policy. Uh, thank you. I think I think whilst they're all um, you know d design reflecting character etc. I think whilst they're all um, highly relevant considerations, I think really that that's the detail that would come forward um, as part of the plan application process. As we talked yesterday about other policies within the plan, and I'm just mindful that the, the, the plan is read as a whole. Um, you know, so let's say you know EN21 and EN22 would apply. The council doesn't need to say, um, or the plan doesn't need to say. Um, and development must accord with X, Y, and Z because it would it would have to accord with all the relevant policies. The plan is read as a whole, um, and I think that's where you know your issues around character design. I mean, we talked yesterday. There were some very extensive policies on design, and um, the EN policies in particular would all would, would would all kick in for a for a development proposal. So I think there's probably enough within there. Likewise, yesterday we even talked about you know construction and environmental management plans. And the requirement for applicants to 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 submit those. Um, so again, I think I think given the the number and the very um, extensive coverage of the other policies, um, I, I'm satisfied that there's enough within the plan read as a whole that um, you know in in case of a future scheme, for example, um, that there'd be there'd be you know plenty of policies for the council to to consider these issues against. But you know, completely appreciate the point, and, it, and it's often a balance, isn't it, between um, you know setting things out in an allocation to make it clear, um, but but mindful that the plan is read as a whole. Any other comments on the policy itself, in terms of its sort of wording, how it's set out, its requirements? Yes, sir, thank you. No, and any sort of final comments on on this um, on this allocation? Then, obviously. Yes, as I said, as I said yesterday, sort of, um, you know, I, I will need to um, go out and have a detailed look at this. Um, so, sort of, we'll, we'll be in touch through the program officer with regard to doing that, um, and then, um, and then, obviously, and you know, going forward in terms of the adoption of the plan, there would be subject to main modification and consultation. So, it, it is, you know, likely that the decision um, may well um, be reached on uh, on the call in during the course of the examination. Um, at, at which stage, um, obviously, make make me aware of that through the program officer. Um, I'm sure that the the developers or, or the council will, and then I'll have to take a, you know, sort of digest that and take a view as to what happens thereafter. Um, you know, in, in that regard, we're in in the same position as as we were before. Um, you know, but but we have, as far as as this plan is concerned, um, you know, we have extensively discussed the issues, be it through 
the strategy, the way in which the councils determine the sites, the LVIA, the policies. So we have, you know, over the course of, of the last two or three months, um, you know, covered all the issues and, and I've heard all the representations. Uh, Mr. Scully. Uh, just so uh, when you're looking at the site, um, you may find some of the information submitted by uh, Barclay Homes useful in terms of understanding the context of the consented development at Brick Kiln Farm. And, and you need to have that very much in your mind uh, when you're walking the site and the, and the area in general. Uh, Mr. Watson. Thank you. So, um, CPRE Kent, of course, believes in a plan led approach to development. Um, and I think the same is true of the other objectors to the um, to this allocation. Um, I don't think uh, that should be taken to mean that um, we feel that uh, the plan process can um, override the specific um, planning inquiry into this site that um, has taken place. The timing is, of course, very unfortunate, and we are where we are. It's a pity it's, uh, the, the Secretary of State's determination has been delayed and has, ha hadn't made this session largely unnecessary. It would be a very unfortunate result of the planning process if, if the inclusion of this policy in the local plan um, placed, as it were, a potential developer of this site in a, a better position than they would otherwise have been in circumstances where the Secretary of State uh, agreed with the um, Natural England and the High World AONB, the, the public body is responsible for the protection of the AONB, um, that this site should not have a major development on it. Um, I hope that that would not be the case and that it would be accepted that the inclusion of this policy would take effect subject in, entirely to the, uh, the Secretary of State's decision on the application in question. Thank you. Richie. <clears throat> Um, so just just to I mean, so just in relation to that, sir, um, so you obviously have a different task, as you know, to the Inspector and Secretary of State in determining the, the planning application, um, whereas you can sensibly talk about the issue of a planning application prejudging prematurely the local plan process, which of course was a point that was raised at the inquiry. So there isn't any sensible way really in which one can talk about any decision that you make prejudicing or prejudging the Secretary of State's decision. That, that, that's just not the way it works because it's a plan-led system. Um, and in any event, so you are dealing with a different task to that of the Secretary of State and the Inspector. So, so um, we, don't, we, we take the view that prejudice, prematurity can't work both ways. It only applies when one's thinking about whether an application for development and a development control decision could prejudice the plan process. You can't have a situation in which um, your tasks are prejudges or prejudices a planning application. That's just not something that planning law and policy recognises. So, so that's the first thing. So secondly, on a practical issue about the site visit, so, and I think I may have mentioned this to you at one of the earlier sessions. Um, so most of the, if you obviously let us know through the programme officer, most of the site you can walk completely unaccompanied um, as long as we know that you're there on that day. The only issue so is if you want to go within phase one, it's currently a construction site. So there would have to be someone there with you for that part alone. And so I wondered whether practically it would be of use to you if we sent you what was the agreed site visit plan for the inquiry um, so that you know where the your, your uh, fellow inspector walks into and what was agreed by all the main parties to be the, the relevant route to to take so if, if that would be useful to you so we can provide that um, to you we're already I think providing you with that one document we referred to earlier um, in relation to the relationship with Brick Kiln Farm. But if that would be helpful, we're happy to provide that to you as well. So, so you at least know what the parties agreed was the route to take on the inquiry. 
I think if it was agreed, then then yes, it would be be helpful, but but not if there was any disagreement on it. Yeah. So if there wasn't any disagreement at the end. I think it was an agreed route that all parties signed but signed up to. Um, so so I'll, I'll make sure that you okay. you receive that. Okay. Well, yeah. You, you, you can send it through the program officer just just, just for information. Um, obviously, I'll yeah sort of ha have a look at it and sort of come up with my own sort of judgments on on where this needs to be looked at from. Um, if you could also just just email the program officer the relevant relevant contact. Then if I if I do need to make to uh, touch base with people for sort of health and safety reasons, et cetera, if you can um, yes, just, just email the program officer. Um, so that's on, on her radar and we'll, um, we'll, we'll get that set up. Thank you, sir. Anything else on this allocation? There's nothing uh, more from this side, sir. I think you've been uh, given all the information um, that is relevant to considering this allocation. I'll just make this further point, however, and that's distinguishing your role from that of the Secretary of State at the moment. Um, you're not considering this site in the planning balance against a five-year supply of housing, for example. Um, what you're doing is considering this site uh, in the context of the strategic options available to this council in plan making over a 15-year period. And that is what sets you apart uh, from the Secretary of State in this process. So other than that, I don't think uh, there's anything else um, we need to, to say. No. Um, there was a reserve session next Tuesday, um, but it's, it's, it's not needed. I saw late yesterday evening a request, I think it was from Paddock Wood Town Council, querying whether or not we were using a reserve session to talk about viability because the council's viability consultant on, on the relevant day um, was not there. Um, but but no, we, we we agreed at that session that we we wouldn't need to come back um, to look um, particularly um, at, at viability at this stage. So no, there's there's no requirement for the reserve session next week. Um, so just a question for the council is whether or not um, so th this would be the last um, hearing session of the um, examination. Um, so whether or not there was anything else that the council um, again sort of housekeeping procedural ways forward. Um, I know that we've sort of been, been through a lot um, of, of, um, <coughs> of, of sessions and, and we've, we've talked about main modifications and we've also talked about sort of um, notes here and there. Um, so I think in terms, of, in terms of sort of my request would be as, as an immediate action. And um, if I could ask the council in the first instance, just, just some just some point next week, just to send me through just a real basic bullet point list of all the notes that I've asked for, um, and sort of bullet point list of main modifications to policies. So it's not it's not the main modifications. It's just you know main modification. I don't know, pick one. En twenty. You know, we talked about changing the word into a line with the MPPF on agricultural land. Just a real sort of high level document. Um, that's just purely for, for my own benefit, so I can cross-refer to my notes and just make sure at this stage that we haven't missed anything. There was nothing outstanding that we discussed at the hearings, which just, you know, would slip through the net, so to speak. Um, so it's, it's not a sort of publicly available document. It's just a, it's just a checklist for my own, my own benefit to, to cross-refer to my own notes. That, that's being provided. That's being uh, done at this very moment, sir. Yeah. Jolly good, and, and, and as I said yesterday, um, sort of in, in closing to other participants, really, um, yeah, next immediate stage is for me to sort of get out and, and have a look at the, the, the sites and, and some of the issues, and then obviously um, commit to writing to the council um, as soon as practically possible on um, on, on ways forwards and, and soundness issues that we didn't quite get to the bottom of on, on some of those issues. Very good, sir, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, that really is me. So, see, thank thank you all for your time. Um, I know there's been there's been a lot of sessions. It is a big plan. I think it's over five hundred odd pages of, mm. of local plans. So there's a big plan. There's lots of policies, lots of sites, um, lots of constraints. Um, so so thank you for your time and appreciate. You know, some sessions ran over and you know we had to sit until six p.m. and you know other sessions 
including this week, we had a, a very short lunch break. So um, no, appreciate that. It, it certainly does help because it's meant that we've only really needed to use today as a reserve site, but that was actually um, really in relation to sort of factors outside of the examination, really. So, well, um, so, so. so can we extend our great appreciation to you for the metic meticulous and fair way in which you have conducted the uh, hearing session? So thank you very much. Okay, yeah, I thank you. that on behalf of CPRE Kent, um, who have appeared in many sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And just finally, um, Hannah, I know you're sitting in for, for, for Charlotte today. Um, was there anything that we needed to be aware of before we sort of wrapped everything up? Um, no, not on my end. No. Okay, well, thank you all for your time then. Um, so that brings the, the hearings to a close. Um, um, so thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.